the mood and sentiment here on Davos. Uh, if you walk down the promenade here in Davos, one thing is visibly clear, and that is the dominance of India. Six Indian states being represented here, uh, and they're all charming investors, green investors, to put in more money uh, into their respective states and, of course, uh, in India. The mood in the Indian contingent, which by the way is one of the largest delegations here uh, at Davos, is also relatively buoyant and relatively more optimistic in comparison to their global counterparts. Things in India at this point in time look less tumultuous than they do in the rest of the world. To talk about the road ahead, to talk about the outlook for 2022, and more importantly, uh, what the future holds in terms of foreign direct investments, export opportunities, uh, we are joined by Team India here. Thank you very much to my guests for joining me on the CNBC TV 18 special conversation. Katie Ramarao, let me start by asking you, as I pointed out, uh, you've taken over the promenade. India has clearly taken over the promenade. Have you taken over mind space and mind share as well? I think we certainly have because, you know, I, uh, India as a country um, is a compelling business opportunity that no global investor can currently ignore or uh, overlook. And uh, among India, uh, I mean, all the Indian states, among all Indian states, I think uh, the competition certainly was extremely visible. You know, we have had uh, six states, like you pointed out, and I would like to believe my state was the best. But uh, <laughs> of course nevertheless, you would. <laughs> <laughs> nevertheless, I think all states did really well. And I think uh, what was uh, extremely evident is the fact that um, different gateways into India, because, you know, we have 28 different gateways uh, if you'd want to come and invest in India. Each of us was basically presenting and trying to get into the mind space of the investor trying to ensure that uh, you know we, we uh, create the larger of course we all operate under the larger rubric of India so therefore uh very, very compelling business case and extremely good uh, positive response. Mm -hmm. You know, you said that it's a compelling case. Uh, and given what's happening with the global volatility and the global uncertainty at this point in time, as I said, India uh, in a position of relative strength today in comparison to what we are seeing. Has that been a big factor, the geopolitical alignment as well as the global uncertainty in the conversations that you're having with investors? Absolutely. In fact, I won't name names, but... Uh, Please do. <laughs> and and people, numbers. A lot of the people we spoke to who were uh, commenting on the fact that uh, you know a great alternative possibly to China especially after the geopolitical equation between the US the China the West and uh, uh, China is India so therefore uh, lots of interest lots of excitement and most importantly I think uh, the fact that um, India offers a bevy of opportunities in variety of sectors I mean we are the life sciences capital of the world we are the pharmacy of the world our technology prowess is well known the information technology prowess is well known we are a dominant player even in the financial services and insurance sector. So many, many opportunities have been discussed. In fact, my state backed a few. We're very excited about it. Stadler, a European uh, rail company, is investing in my state. I can, I mean, there's plenty of other things that uh, we're kicked about. But uh, on the whole, I think India has really uh, taken a lot of mind space uh, in Davos this time. Sanjeev, I want to address that issue with you as well. And we were speaking alongside Ministers Puri and Goyal uh, as they laid out uh, the reform roadmap, not just for the next 12 months, but over the next few years. Uh, in the conversations that you've had with your global counterparts and to, to KTR's point about China plus one, which is not a new theme, uh, but perhaps a theme that is being accelerated in today's context, uh, where do you see FDI coming in. Manufacturing is the big focus area that the government is trying to push, courtesy the PLI schemes and so on and so forth. But are we finally at that inflection point when it comes to uh, FDI in manufacturing? Shouldn't the changing geopolitics is driving this inflection point. And as you know, the PLI scheme is for 13 key sectors right now. Um, that should jumpstart uh, investments in these sectors. Now, this window of opportunity has opened. It's not going to be there for too long because we are not the only country waiting to jump onto that bandwagon. There are many other countries. Bangladesh has already started on textiles, Vietnam for electronic components. But none of them have the scale mm. and the capability and volume of people, of, of the educated workforce that a country like India can provide. Mm. And hence, we believe that the time has come for us in some of these key sectors where we have both capability and we can build capacity to be able to create the manufacturing hub for the world. Mm -hmm. Anish, let me get you to elaborate on that. The window of opportunity, and I think that's a very important point that Sanjeev makes, that uh, let's not assume that because it is China plus one, it will necessarily mean India, uh, both 
government as well as Indian industry needs to ensure that we get the pieces right uh, to draw in foreign direct investment. A lot has already happened. How confident do you feel that we're going to now be able to get to that 25% of manufacturing share to GDP? Shireen, our time is now. And I've met with at least 25 to 30 global CEOs one-on-one -on -one over the last three days. Uh, one of them actually mentioned that they have an ABC strategy, anywhere but China. And that's not enough for us, because that is not the narrative. It has to be India. It is not about ABC. What I also see is they have been pleasantly surprised by, one, the strength of the Indian economy. Second, by the messages that have gone across from the Indian delegation here overall. And that is a very powerful message that has gone across. And third is they're saying India's leadership in climate change. And those are really putting India on the global map. So for us, this is a time we have to take advantage of it. Okay, yes, that is something that we need to take advantage of. TV Narendra, let me come to you because, you know, uh, metals uh, was the sector that was driving the CapEx revival. Uh, you were the guys who kick-started it and the expectation and the hope is that the rest of industry will follow suit. It's been a bull run for commodities clearly at this point in time and it doesn't look like it's ebbing anytime soon, which is why we've seen measures being imposed to try and cool things down. How much does that impact you in the short term and what will it mean in the medium to long term in terms of your investment plans? I think in the short term, yes, there will be an impact of the export taxes and the pricing of steel for the domestic markets. And I think the intention is to cool down inflation, so we respect that call. But I think in the medium to long term, uh, obviously, we want to wait and see how long is this tax going to stay. Because I think India is a great uh, uh, steel producer, can be a great steel producer and exporter. It's a natural place to make steel because we have lots of iron ore. And there's no reason for a Japan or Korea or China to be exporting steel when India has all this iron ore. So I think over a period of time, India should position itself as a country which can step into the gaps which are created by Japan, Korea, China, and now Ukraine and Russia moving out of the global trade markets for steel. Mm -hmm. uh, CapEx continues as is? CapEx for now continues as is, uh, but obviously when we plan long-term growth, we assume that 10 to 15 percent of what we produce will be exported. So, uh, you know, if we have to recalibrate on that, we'll wait and see what the government thinks about the long-term future of these taxes. Mm -hmm. You know, so far, demand is held up. And I'm asking you this question in light of the escalation that we're seeing uh, input costs across the board up. Do you believe that that's going to, at least in the short to medium term, start to impinge on demand? So I think the actions that have been taken now is certainly helping cool prices to some extent. The cut in taxes on uh, fuel is bringing down the input costs for many industries. Again, uh, input costs, as far as steel is concerned, will come down. Uh, hopefully, if there have been investments or activity held back because of high input costs, that will get addressed. But I think the challenge, even for people like us, is there are input costs coming from overseas. Yeah. Coal prices are still very high. So we need to think about it more from a global uh, chain point of view. But I certainly am bullish about uh, the uh, growth in India, even this year using commercial vehicles, mm -hmm. using passenger vehicles, all doing quite well. Mm -hmm. Construction and infrastructure is certainly going to do well. A lot of investment in supply chains, warehousing, etc. So I think overall I'm quite positive. Well, Jaitip Gala, let me ask you, you know, I was having a conversation with the folks at McKinsey this morning uh, and their hypothesis of the India growth story is the two-track economy. They believe that manufacturing is poised to take off and finally will be able to achieve the targets that we've aspirationally wanted to get to. And, of course, on the IT side and the new technology side, that will be the other big driver as far as growth is concerned. On balance, how confident do you feel about where things currently are and, more importantly, where we hope to get on the back of both these growth engines? On IT and... Uh, Manufacturing, IT, the two tracks. So, I think, um, it, as the whole panel seems to uh, resonate on this point, is that it's time for India. It's India's time right now. I think in Davos, it's, it's even more um, acutely uh, visible because, like, you know, with, with the lockdowns in China, China is not present here. So our presence has been magnified that much more this time than it usually is anyway. But in all the panels that I've been uh, um, attending and the speakers I've been listening to, I think the narrative is pretty clear that uh, there's going to be a new world order and we need to figure out what our position is going to be in that world order. But signs are very positive and I'm sure we're going to come out in that new world order in a much better position than we were in the past. Mm -hmm. I think uh, the non-aligned uh, position that India has taken historically was a very insightful 
uh, of our leaders to take that position, and that's proving to be very useful for us now to be able to nav navigate our way through this. It's not going to be a unipolar world. It's not going to be a bipolar world. It's going to be a multipolar world, and India is going to be one of those strong poles. Mm -hmm. Shobhna, you know, in this multipolar world, uh, to Jaitev Gala's point, that India enjoys an advantage, not just because of how geopolitics is likely to reshape the world order, but also on account of things that, you know, we are good at and the capabilities that we can deliver on. What do you believe will be the drivers going forward? And this is a point, Shireen, I'm glad you brought up because nobody used the S word here. You know, services. Uh, so I would double down services, services, services. India's always been good at that. We need to create more jobs. And I think in this whole world, uh, the new world order will also be about, you know, while people are, are trying to near shore some of their, you know, things that have supply chain mm. constraints, uh, they will still find great shortages in terms of workforce to be able to do that. And I think India has an opportunity there. Let me give you an example of yeah. healthcare. Uh, we, if we can remove the choke points, if the government can really talk about and, and go full on to say that uh, remove the barriers for Indians to be able to work across the globe, Indian healthcare workers. So there are countries now who are saying, why don't you add German or, or uh, Spanish or you know Japanese to and English, of course, improve it mm. to, to the nurses' curriculum. Huge shortage with this it's an opportunity you know if we can if we have a great international curriculum mm. we have the we have the people that can be trained uh, lots of women that can mm. get jobs so i think services across i'm seeing that you know they're bringing all the huge amounts you know of uh, amazon told just told me they have 100000 people <coughs> most of them in in hyderabad uh, you know and and this is only going to grow people are going to start employing in india and Indians have the opportunity to work globally. Mm. So I do think that uh, that's going to be a huge GDP driver of the next, um, you know, of the next decade. Mm -hmm. We'll probably lead there. And you're absolutely right. We sh never should discount the impact that services can have on growth. And to a large extent, services have been driving growth for India. Anisha, in terms of untapped potential and untapped areas of opportunity, we just heard one from Shobhana there. What else would you like to put down on the list in terms of focus areas? I think we have to uh, expand services, so I fully agree with Shobhana on that. Uh, but manufacturing is one area where we've got huge potential. And with the ability to create better infrastructure in India, with the ability of the uh, labor and the productivity have in India, it really should become the manufacturing hub. Mm. So that's what I would really focus on uh, in the next few years, to be able to attract top quality manufacturing to India. Okay. Ketia, let me come to you now. You know, uh, to address some of the choke points, especially with the aspiration of developing more manufacturing prowess, as well as focusing on the services side. What, for instance, are you doing at the state level? The central government has decided to take forward new labor codes and so on and so forth. They haven't been operationalized yet. But a lot of this happens at the state level. So let me use Telangana as, it, as an example of being able to address some of the choke points that constrain and hold back growth and development of industry. Well, let me firstly tell you our focus has been on the three eyes, innovation, infrastructure, and inclusive growth. In terms of infrastructure, Shireen, I think the focus has to be on scale. Because, you know, India can't be competing with a country like China or the U.S. if we, if we do not think on scale, you know. A scale will bring the economies of scale. And therefore, in Telangana, what we've done is we have now, we're on the verge of launching the world's largest pharma cluster uh, in about 19,000 acres because Hyderabad is a life sciences hub. We, have, we are home to India's largest med tech park in about 300 plus acres. We are also home to India's largest textile park in about 1250 acres. So we've already done these. They're operationalized. But what's more exciting for us is now Government of India's focus on PLIs mm. in a variety of sectors. As Sanjeev pointed out, in textiles, for instance, you're va we are languishing behind uh, uh, Bangladesh, which is, which, is a, which is sad because this is a sector that can really provide large-scale employment, especially in rural areas, and even food processing, for that matter. You know, a state like Telangana, which has really done very, very well on agricultural produce, now we started focusing on food processing. We are, we are creating... Uh, we're calling them TSFPZ, the Telangana State Food Processing Zones, mm. on scale again. Each of these with more than 500 plus acres about in about uh, 10 different districts. 
So what this is going to do really is, you know, focus on manufacturing to begin with. And of course, uh, it will also create a ripple of opportunities for the entire ecosystem. Medical devices, mm. we import nearly 80% of our med devices. We need to correct that. We've had several meetings here. Hopefully, you know, we'll bring in lots, lots more uh, in terms of uh, opportunities. Well, Sanjeev, you know, speaking of opportunities, you also need to fund some of these aspirations and we need to fund some of these plans as well. Just in terms of the credit requirement, uh, given where we are today in terms of credit growth and where we want to be to be able to uh, finance some of these aspirations, uh, I've been asking him for a five <laughs> <laughs> why, why haven't have you given him one? I have to evaluate his credit score first. <laughs> so, you know, on, on the banking and the NBFC side, to be able to push uh, the kind of growth that we aspire for, what more needs to be done? First, if we have to grow as an economy at 9-10%, uh, financial services needs to grow roughly two and a half, three times that. So we are talking of 25-30% uh, growth rates over there. Um, one, we have to ensure that we can enable the middle class, the low middle class. That's where domestic consumption in large volumes will come from. This requires inclusive financial services, which means how do we use the combination of jam that the Indian government has worked on with the private sector. Yeah. But uh, by getting better and better understanding on data and closer and closer to the customer. Hence, through a combination of digital and uh, physical media, mm. we need many more banks, many more NBFCs to get closer to the customers. Rural banking no longer can be seen as some kind of a punishment to banking. We have to find profitable models mm. to be able to access those customers. Next, when you look at uh, typically MSME customers would look for short to medium term loans. Banks are the best places to offer those loans. But when we look at funding our long term infrastructure, bank funding is not the ideal mm. source. You have to go to either to the corporate market or to the insurance and the pension market. Mm. As insurance today, this industry has grown with the private sector for the last 20 years. But 50% of insurance funds have to stay invested in uh, government securities another 25% in corporate bonds. So effectively, you're taking money away from where it should be used. Insurance is long-term money, it should yeah. go into long-term users. And yeah. that's where we've represented to the regulator as well, and hopefully we'll see some relaxation on it. Finally, what we're talking about is the aspirations of large Indian companies to go international. Where are the large banks that mm. can fund those acquisitions or those new investments? Banks aren't allowed to fund acquisitions currently. Other than State Bank, there is no other large bank that can take care of the ambitions of uh, India Inc. And no country in the world has uh, grown without a strong domestic financial services system. So we need to start thinking about setting the stage mm. in each of these areas. Yeah. Actually, one quick point to mm. add to what Sanjeev said. You know, today in India, in a lot of infrastructure projects, we have the Canadian pensioners' money being used. Where is the Indian pensioners' money being used? I think this is the time for Indian government. If you really want that double-digit growth where financial mm. services has to grow at three times, as Sanjeev said, we have to make some bold moves. We have to come out with some bold reforms. Unless we leverage our strengths. What are the bold reforms that you want to see? Absolutely. I would want to see uh, the EPF, the ESI, and you know all other government PSUs to start investing in markets, to start... you know Because you know if, if you look at my state, for instance, and if I want to fund my infrastructure projects, I am handicapped by the fact that I can only borrow from certain agencies. Even FRBM possibly needs to be re-looked at because if the growth has to come, the investments have to come into infrastructure, and uh, we cannot have the uh, you know kind of block uh, and tell me that only JICA and ADB and IMF are allowed. Mm. We need more but, and more agencies and that, more and more that, capital coming in. But the FRBM is about fiscal discipline, not so much about you know who you can raise, raise money from. No, no, there are two aspects to yeah. this. FRBM, of course, is about fiscal discipline. But what we have to remember is the debt GDP ratio of a state like Telangana is 25 percent. The debt GDP, GSDP, debt GDP ratio of India is 65. Debt GDP of US is about 108. Mm. Debt GDP of Japan is 200. Would you then say they are not fiscally prudent? Mm. My point is, if you really want to fund infrastructure... But they are very different economies. I mean, you know, if, if we had done what the Fed decided to do through the course of the pandemic, we would have been downgraded. See, if you are a growing economy and if you want to grow fast, I think there's no substitute for the infrastructure creation. And if you do not have the capital to do that, how are you going to, how are you going to pull off this 10 trillion mm. dream or the 15 trillion dream? In 1987, India and China both were for $70 billion. Mm. Now today, China is 16 trillion, we are still 3 trillion. I think that kind of tells you a story. Sad one at that. Well, we, we, we want to 
uh, leap and, and make that leap quickly is, is, uh, is the point. But let me come to you, TV Narendran. Uh, you know, the big export aspiration that's been held out by the government to drive growth, a trillion dollars by 2030 in merchandise as well as a trillion dollars by 2030 in services. Uh, do we have enough by way of competitiveness? Because, you know, there will be FTAs and uh, trade agreements and so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, Indian industry needs to be competitive to get a larger share of the global market. Where do we currently stand on that front? I think uh, we stand pretty well uh, when you look at competitiveness within the factory gates, right? Where we lose competitiveness is outside the factory gates to me. And that's where the answer is in building infrastructure because not only does it help many companies scale up because you're supplying to these infrastructure projects, but you're also reducing the cost of doing the business outside the factory gates. So I think we need to invest a lot more than we have done currently uh, because so far where have we done best in export services? Because you have a great telecom infrastructure and you're not constrained by the ports and roads and mm. railways and things like that. Mm. So unless you create that kind of a situation for manufacturing, uh, you will struggle. And I think we are heading towards that. And there are many, many world-class companies in India, many companies and industries which are ideally located in India. Like I said, anything which is dependent on the geology of India should be promoted because uh, we are blessed with riches below the ground. So yes. we need to translate that into riches above the ground. And I think that's where manufacturing comes in. And I think we are heading there. Well, you know, uh, I... W Yes, in a green way. You're absolutely right. Uh, Shobhna, please. And that, I think, is also the big opportunity for India, uh, is uh, as we move forward, let's do it in a sustainable, greener, cleaner way. And that also opens up opportunities for industry and for business. It opens up opportunities, but it doesn't scare also, because, you know, here we are where you're, you're starting from fresh, you're starting green field, where around the world they've polluted for years. And here we're, we're going to do it, and we're going to do it fresh and we're going to do it green. Yesterday when they were talking about, you know, that India will be one of the biggest hydrogen producers uh, at, at the cheapest point, look at us with solar and the way that every industry, you're making green steel. So as we go through, I think that the two big uh, things that will, that will probably unlock India's potential, one is the fact that we're conscious that uh, you know, whether it's heat waves or floods, mm. that we have to do it very sustainably because uh, the people will not forgive us with that. The next generation won't yeah. forgive us. But the next thing is that we have so much financial digital inclusion that Indians know how to use their phones and make and do it powerfully because data is cheap mm. and the cost of phones and, and you know, I've heard at least on three panels that I was on, the praise for uh, for India's UPI. Yeah. So we're doing things right, and I think this digital inclusion, and now we're moving the needle on health. So these these are powerful initiatives. They are powerful initiatives. One other issue that I want to talk to each one of you about uh, is. Uh, bringing more women into the workforce and if India has to get to that five trillion dollar uh, milestone or 15 trillion dollar milestone we cannot do it uh, if we don't have enough women participating in the growth story if we don't have enough women contributing to GDP and of course they do in the informal side but not so much on the formal side so how do we get more women into the workforce you must ask these guys. <laughs> that's uh, that's yeah, exactly yeah, that's yeah, exactly what I intend to do. Uh, we have more women than we have men, especially in our top leadership. So, <laughs> so no, no. So we're doing it right. You all should explain. <laughs> this one, this one, the mic is going to be passed around. That's yes. <laughs> okay. One of the ways in which we can do it is obviously focus on sectors where women have been traditionally employed in a, in a, in a big number instance uh, textiles I think it's a huge huge opportunity that India is uh, India has to focus now especially with PLI scheme coming in that's a, that's one huge opportunity again the second thing I would say is most importantly for a state like Telangana we came out with a policy of earmarking one-third of plots in every industrial park for women entrepreneurs mm -hmm. we have created three dedicated industrial parks for women we came out with what is called as a V hub a women entrepreneurs hub to encourage innovation and uh, startup culture among women entrepreneurs so we have done a little, I wouldn't say we have done a lot, but uh, the possibility to do humongous uh, amounts is there, provided we focus on those sectors which can actually provide gainful employment. Mm -hmm. No, no, but you've also made Hyderabad so safe. Yeah, and, and that, 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 that is a factor, that's a factor. Yeah, yeah, just it. Yeah, so as you alluded to, you know, 
uh, historically, women have very much been part of the workforce. If you take the rural sector, every woman is working in that sector. I think uh, if I look to how, you know, how did the country change during colonialization, I think a lot of our current mores and uh, culture and uh, taboos were built during the colonial age. Mm. And uh, you, know, you see that more in the middle class and upper class than you see you know, when you go to the rural villages and all. So I think that cultural change has to happen. The mindset has to happen. You know, there can't be glass walls as much as there can't be glass yeah. ceilings. There, it can't be that women are only good in human resources and public relations, but they're not good in finance and manufacturing, yeah. for instance. You know, those, those mindsets have to change and women themselves also have to come out. Mm. Their families have to support them. The governments have to create that cultural change. Yeah, yeah. TV. I think it's uh, very important, as you said, uh, so in manufacturing and in steel, for instance, in Tata Steel, we've said we need to have at least 25% of the women on the shop floor, 25% of the workflows on the shop floor as women. And that also means change of laws. There are many states which don't allow three shift working for women. So we obviously need to guarantee safety, but we need to change the laws, that's one. Secondly, create the infrastructure, create the mindsets, and not just stop at women. We've, in the last one year, recruited 100 transgenders. So, you know, you, we need to be more inclusive in getting different sections of society in. Mm. And I think it's a very, very important uh, change that we're driving. We're, we're, yeah, yeah, quick, yeah, I just had yeah. to quickly add, uh, even the maternity leave and paternity yeah. leave, these type of policies also, companies have to not only give more liberal maternity leave, they have to give paternity leave also. Absolutely. The fathers also have to take responsibility. Absolutely. Right? absolutely. The, the fathers do need to take responsibility. No, no, yes. And I was not running away from the answer. I was just giving <laughs> others a chance first. Uh, the number of things that is happening, as Narain said, on the manufacturing side, we are seeing young women get into manufacturing roles, compete, as well as uh, the other gender as well. Uh, for example, I know in Bajaj Auto, we have entire assembly lines run only by women, mm. so, and we are seeing many other people do that. In CI, we have mentoring and support services that women provide to other women. Look at the startup world. Mm. It does not differentiate between men and women. That's not entirely true. I mean, there's there's very few women uh, startup founders today in India. We need to see more, but that's ones. a global problem as well. Look at the yeah. successful ones. There are yeah. many other reasons for that yeah. as well. And finally, what we have to do is, when I look at banking and insurance, there's a very large requirement for women in branches and offices in tier two, tier three, tier four cities. Now, as Bajaj, we've started an initiative where we train young boys and girls. Uh, in tier three, tier four colleges mm. and make them job ready to get into financial services, mm. whether banking, insurance or asset management. 70% of those people getting trained are girls. Family incomes are doubling, if yeah. not tripling, yeah. but they're all in small towns. Plus, it helps business because they want people from those towns, but then they stay on longer as well. Sure. So there is work that's happening. That's good to hear. Let me end by asking each of you, you know, the government is, uh, uh, has completed eight years in office now, three in the second term. Uh, in terms of the various measures taken, the steps already announced, what to your mind, and I'm going to ask each one of you, the single uh, most impactful measure taken so far in your assessment and the one thing that you believe remains unfinished? Sanjeev? I would say the continued focus on expansion of using digital services and technologies to bring in inclusive growth into the country. That's the biggest. And unfinished? Unfinished continuing to do that in the non-digital space as well. Okay. Shobna? I like what he said as an overall, but I, specifically for healthcare, the largest insurance scheme in the world, Aishman Bharat, and, and I think that when we have a healthy India, that's when you will have a healthier GDP. So, so I'm, I'm going to stick to, to my knitting and, and say that uh, government has done well, uh, but it's in the hands of the states. So I do think that state by state, as you go on, everyone now with COVID is using that as a focus. Unfinished, um, there's still more to do, that there's going to be a huge burden of NCDs. And I think that, ev that every state and the this, and this center should start spending more of GDP on health. Jaydev? So I think uh, the country has been doing very well in pursuing the elect electrification strategy and also promoting the energy transition and EV adoption. So I think um, that they need to continue to promote that. It, it does require government support mm -hmm. and government policies to make that happen. Okay. Um, in terms of unfinished business, I think in this space, I don't really see that many gaps. I think the policies are very clear. They just need to you know, be com committed to it and execute.
TV. I think uh, for me, digitization and focus on infrastructure are great things which have happened. Unfinished is to me education and health, uh, particularly primary education. I'm going to give you the final say. Thank you, Shireen. I think um, the biggest reform has been uh, in terms of making it easy to enter India. I think business reforms have been brought in a big way and a healthy uh, competition has been set among all states uh, in terms of ease of doing business, which has really helped. Uh, in terms of unfinished, uh, where do I start? Uh, because uh, I think capital infusion into infrastructure, focus on health, education, large opportunities that are being missed in terms of uh, large-scale employment sector, you know, employment generating sectors like textiles, electronics. These are all humongous opportunities. We cannot be not leveraging our economy to create infrastructure because unless we create uh, large-scale industrial parks, mm. we're not going to achieve economies of scale. Unless you support and encourage. Uh, states which are performing, you're not going to be able to deliver. So unless you think of India truly as a cooperative uh, federal republic, yeah. you're not going to be able to achieve that uh, dream of ours of uh, seeing India in the first world nations. Well, I, I think the mood clearly uh, at this point in time is one of confidence, but also uh, the opportunity, as we've been pointing out through the course of this conversation, the opportunity presents itself. The time is now. All stakeholders, the government, industry, the social sector, all stakeholders must come together, act together, execute. And that's where we often see the gaps. Execute to ensure that we capitalize on the opportunities that we are presented with. Many thanks uh, to my guests for joining me here in Davos for this conversation. Uh, the CII, CNBC TV 18 Davos Dialogue. Uh, plenty of food for thought. We leave you with more from this panel for tonight. Goodbye. Thanks for watching.